Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for inviting me along today. I'm really excited to chat to you and um, share a bit about myself. My name's Catherine McMahon. I'm an Associate Professor at Edith Cowan University, and I'll be talking to you today about management of eutrophication in coastal waters. Okay, I'm just trying to move to the next slide. It seems to be stuck. Yeah, it's stuck. So I'm just going to go out and stop sharing and then I'll try again. Don't worry, we can clip this bit out. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So you can see those slides. I'm just going to go into presentation mo mode and double check that it's going to move through. It is going to move through now. Okay, so this is the official start. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about the management of eutrophication in coastal waters. Thank you for having me along. Um, before I start, I'd just really like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Noongar elders and the um, emerging and past and present um, whose land in which we're meeting today because we all are in um, in Perth. And so what I'm going to do today is talk to you about four things in this um, in this presentation. A little bit about my journey in science and how I got to where I am today. The significance of coastal ecosystems and then specifically on nutrients and eutrophication and some of the management approaches that we can use um, for eutrophication. So from a child, uh, I just loved the outdoors, the beach and the ocean. I grew up on the beach. I actually grew up very close to your school in Malaloo. Um, and then I went on to high school and I was really interested in Japanese and music. Um, and so I went to Greenwood Senior High School and that's all right because I could do both Japanese and music there. But when I was at high school, I just really loved the subject biology. And it was that love of biology that made me want to go to university where I did a science degree. And I studied botany, plants and zoology, animals. And then in my final year, I did a, it's an honours program. So it's a special um, one year where you do an, a research project. And that's actually me in 1994 in Geograph Bay scuba diving, doing my, my honours project on the right hand side of the screen. Um, when I finished university, I did a variety of different jobs. I worked as a consultant and I also worked as an environmental officer. And that was where I really started my journey into water quality. And I spent two years um, working for the, at the time it was called the Water and Rivers Commission, but now it's the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation. And I worked with them. I went out on a boat once a week measuring water quality in the Swan River estuary. So that was a really, um, a really great job. But in the back of my mind, I always just really loved um, doing research. So I went back to university again and did something called a PhD, where you study for three to four years on a, a particular research topic. And I did that in Queensland. That's me driving the boat on the left-hand side of the screen. And my study was on dugongs and seagrasses, which was really exciting. Then when I finished that, I moved back to Western Australia and I got a job at Edith Cowan University and I've been working there for about 16 years um, doing research, particularly in coastal ecosystems and seagrasses and also teaching in environmental science. So that's my story about marine science. And the area that I work in is in the management and conservation of coastal habitats. So I work with people from government agencies, from industry and a range of students um, doing studies to improve the way that we manage and conserve coastal ecosystems. So why do we care about coastal ecosystems? Well, Australia is quite unique in that it has the sixth longest coast of any nation in the world. And these coastal waters, they're essentially from the land to about three nautical miles out into the sea. 
And 85% of Australians live on the coast within 50 kilometres of the sea. So because most of our population lives there, there's actually quite a lot of pressures in our coastal waters. Now, it is a really significant zone. It supports many industries. So there's aquaculture. So in the, the picture on the top right is actually the abalone farm um, down off Augusta. We have really important fisheries in our coastal waters. And I'm sure many of you are aware of the rock, rock lobster industry, tourism, shipping. Most of the things that we buy that come from overseas get into our shops through shipping. So the ocean is a really important conduit for our economy. Now the coastal zone, they're highly productive. So if you have a look at this map of the globe, it show the colors of the water are showing you the concentration of chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is a pigment. It's a pigment that is found in those tiny uh, cells that photosynthesize the plankton and when the, um, these plankton photosynthesize, they use sunlight and carbon dioxide to produce oxygen and organic, organic compounds, which form the basis of many food webs. So you can see where the yellow is, that's a higher concentration of chlorophyll, meaning a higher concentration of phytoplankton and more productivity. And these yellow, colouring is always around the edge of the continent, so in the coastal zones. Now there's lots of different habitats in the coastal zones as well. So we have wetlands, estuaries, so the picture on the left you can see, I'm just going to move around because the sun's shining on my computer and I can't see it. Um, There's the estuary, the Swan River estuary on the left hand side. Seagrasses, that picture in the middle, form really important habitats. We have coral reefs up in Ningaloo. Um, and in that top picture is stromatolites, which is in Shark Bay in the World Heritage Area. So many threatened species and habitats live in this coastal zone. Now, as you're probably aware, there's many human activities that are impacting the coastal ecosystem and then driving ecosystem change. Things like global warming, ocean warming, heat waves, storms, um, ocean acidification. But what I'm going to talk about today is some of the human impacts that are occur more at the local scale, um, and that is eutrophication. So eutrophication is an increase in the rate of supply. So the amount of both organic matter and nutrients that move into our coastal waters or any aquatic ecosystems. So if you look at that picture on the bottom, you have organic matter or nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus coming into the system. Now, when these nutrients are being added at a faster rate, it causes the phytoplankton and the algae to grow really rapidly and create these blooms. And then when these phytoplankton and algae bloom, that just means there's lots of cells there, Eventually they die, they drop down to the bottom of the water column, they sit on the sediments and there's a lot of organic matter, so dead, dead cells essentially. And whenever there's something dead, you get bacteria or fungi that break that down and release the nutrients back into the system. So the bacteria and the fungi, they need oxygen to survive because we all, all organisms use oxygen for respiration or the majority of them. So when they're in the water body consuming all this material that's breaking down, then the oxygen concentrations in the water body come down. So this is the process of eutrophication. Now, the key nutrients that drive this process are nitrogen and phosphorus. So nitrogen and phosphorus can be, can be delivered to the aquatic um, ecosystems either as particles or organic material, bits of broken up leaves or um, small dead animals, um, or they can also be in the dissolved form. So as ions dissolved in the water. And when it's the most common forms are nitrate. So we have nitrate on the left of the screen, which is one nitrogen atom bound to three oxygen atoms and it has a negative charge. 
Ammonium is another important form of nutrient. So that's one nitrogen atom bound to four hydrogen atoms and it has a positive charge and then phosphate. Another um, way that nutrients can come into the system is by bacteria. So bacteria can use actually nitrogen gas and they can convert that nitrogen gas to ammonia and when it's dissolved in the water, that becomes ammonium. Um, and so that's another way that um, organisms can access nutrients in, in aquatic environments. Now, what this graph is showing is that as the concentration of nutrients increase in the water body, because there's an increasing supply under nutrification, that will increase the growth rate. So if you look on the x-axis, the bottom axis of that graph, where on the left-hand side is zero or a low concentration of nitrogen. And as you move along the axis towards the right, um, that concentration is increasing. And you can see on the y-axis that initially there's a rapid increase in growth rate um, and then it starts to peter off. And as the nutrient concentration gets higher, um, it sort of reaches the slope and you're not gonna get any faster growth. So that's conceptually what you'd expect. And what we have here are some graphs of the growth rates of phytoplankton collected from oceanic waters or coastal waters, sorry. So that net that is in the top picture on the right hand side of the screen, essentially gets dropped into the surface waters. You drag the net along and there's a little tube um, at the bottom of the net that um, filters the water comes out and all the phytoplankton collects in that tube. Um, so the middle picture is just showing you some different cells that are phytoplankton. And then in a simple experiment, you add those cells with some seawater um, into beakers or into jars. And then you have multiple um, jars with different concentrations of nutrients. And then you measure how the number of cells in that jar increases over time. And that's how you work out the growth rates. So in the graphs that you can see on the left hand side, the top one is um, when nitrate has been added and the bottom one is where phosphate has been added. So you can see from zero up to about 10, this rapid increase in the growth rate of those plankton with increasing nutrient concentrations. And interestingly, if you look at the nitrate, it sort of reaches the maximum kind of growth rate at around 20. If you're looking on that x-axis, you go from zero to 20. And then if you go up um, the graph, you can see the growth rate is around 0.6 per day. That's where the growth rate saturates at 20 micromolar concentration of nitrate. But it happens at a lot um, lower concentration for phosphate. So at around two micromolar for phosphate, that's where you see that the curve of the graph flatten off. So plants, most plants require a much higher concentration of nitrate, nitrogen than they do phosphorus. So it's not just the total amount, but also the ratio of the nutrients that can affect the growth rates. So water bodies can be classified by their, their nutrient state. And some of the factors that are included in this kind of classification are the concentrations of nutrients like phosphorus, which we have on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you can see that the states are oligotrophic, which is the lowest concentration of nutrients that usually have the lowest amount of chlorophyll in them and higher secchi depth. So a secchi depth is a scientific instrument. It's a really basic one and you can see it um, in the picture. It's sort of a rope with a, a round disc and the disc is divided into quarters, uh, two quarters are black and two quarters are white in colour. So you lower that disc down and when you can no longer see the difference between the black and the white quadrants, that's called the, the secchi disc depth. So the deeper or the higher the secchi di disc depth, the clearer the water is. And the lower the secchi disc depth, 
the um, more phytoplankton and more turbid the water is, so it's much harder to see. So as you go from oligotrophic to mesotrophic to eutrophic, this is sort of, if, if this is just in one location, you'd be seeing the process of eutrophication, increasing nutrients, higher concentrations of chlorophyll in the water, and less clarity in the water because there's so much phytoplankton. So when eutrophication occurs, you get a range of changes in the ecosystem, and I've talked about a few of them. So if we just think about, and as an example, estuaries, and think of this as the, the Swan River estuary, if you like. Um, so there's nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus that come into the estuary through a variety of um, catchment activities. And then those nutrients are used by the phytoplankton or microalgae to grow. They're used by the, the seagrasses, the plants that grow on the bottom. Um, the microalgae and the seagrasses produce oxygen and it makes it a, a healthy environment for fish and other organisms to live in. Now, when you have eutrophication, you have increase loads, increase amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus coming into the system from a range of um, activities in the catchment. Those concentrations stimulate phytoplankton blooms, but not only phytoplankton blooms, also if you look on the right hand side of the picture, macroalgae, so fast growing filamentous or different types of macroalgae that tend to grow over the seagrasses and kill the seagrasses. So this high primary production, then when, when it dies off, it drops down to the bottom of the estuary where you get this big buildup of organic matter, um, drawing the, and the breakdown of that organic matter reduces the oxygen concentrations. If there's not enough oxygen in the water, then the organisms that are living there are going to die, like fish or any the oysters and mussels that are living in or on, on the sediments. So this is sort of like the, the ecological change that can occur when um, eutrophication happens. And another interesting thing, it's not just the total amount of um, microalgae or phytoplankton that increases, it's also the type of um, microalgae or phytoplankton that change. And often under eutrophication, you, it's more common to have species of phytoplankton that are actually toxic. So they can cause uh, impacts to other organisms that either feed on them or are exposed to the water. So some of these toxic algae can form um, like these toxic compounds that are called like um, paralytic, that cause paralytic shellfish poisoning that not only kills or impacts the organisms, but if we eat them as humans, we can also um, be impacted. So eutrophication is actually really common around the world and we see it um, in the southwest of Western Australia, where we all live. This is an example here of a phytoplankton bloom um, in a lake around the, the Swan River. And you can see all those green, like the water is a green color that's full of phytoplankton in the water. Um, this is an example um, of a toxic algal bloom. So on the right hand side, you can see a map um, of the Swan River where it is red, this is where the toxic algal bloom was present and where it was recommended that you, you couldn't eat the mussels or um, you needed to clean the crabs before eating them um, because of this toxic algal bloom. And it's actually, this is a, on the bottom right hand side, you can see the picture. It just looks like a, a chain of, I don't know, six, golden brown cells. These are the cells that, um, that grow really quickly and they form these chains. They just all join together. Um, and each individual cell has that toxic uh, toxin in it that causes this shellfish poisoning. Um, on the left-hand side is another type of um, toxic algae called nodularia. And it, it just looks like someone has poured green paint into the water. Um, 
And these have been quite common in some places in southwest Western Australia and they impact um, fish. And also if you get your skin exposed to that, if you walk through that water, um, you, your skin would get really itchy as well. This is an example of a macroalgal bloom. This is the Leshenol estuary, which is down near Busselton. Um, some of you may have gone crabbing there at some stage. It certainly was something I did quite regularly as a kid. Um, and in this case, it's a very, really shallow water body. There's lots of nutrients coming into it. And these, what you can see floating on the surface of the water is all this um, filamentous algae that grows really quickly and just forms a mat over everything. And I'm not sure if you've heard, but there's been quite a number of fish kills in the vast Wannerup wetlands. Uh, and this is a, a wetland of inter international significance near Busselton. Um, and what happens here, it's a highly eutrophic system. Um, and either there's toxic algae, or in this case, the oxygen concentrations were so low and the fish couldn't escape uh, that there was um, a big die off of fish. And actually, this, this photo was from about four years ago, but actually a big event happened just last week, and I think about 20,000 fish died. So clearly, if our waterways are getting increasing supply of nutrient, there can be these catastrophic impacts. And these nutrients can come from a range of sources. Uh, that can actually come from the atmosphere. So just falling um, with rainfall, and it is mostly due, the nitrogen in the um, rainfall is mostly coming from the burning of fossil fuels and like vehicle emissions that can have high amounts of nitrous oxide in them. So they get, um, when the fossil fuels get burnt, the, the gases go into the air and they join with the particles of the rain and get rained down as dissolved nitrate. Um, wastewater treatment plants are another um, big source of nutrients. So anything, essentially anything that goes down our toilet or down our sinks and goes to the wastewater treatment plants, they get processed and a lot of the nutrients get removed. Um, and then they most usually get um, discharged into the marine environment. Nowadays, there are some places where they get discharged into the groundwater. So wastewater treatment plants are a big source of nutrients. Just our um, urban environments, if we have gardens or also vehicle emissions that I've already mentioned, if you fertilize your garden and the nutrients drain into the groundwater or into the the stormwater drains and then they get washed into our aquatic ecosystems. Um, agricultural sources, so if you have, uh, you're growing um, wheat or barley um, or vegetables or if you have livestock, there's usually a range of either nutrients that you add to help your crops grow or the manure from the livestock that you have um, can leach into the waterways and increase nutrients. So a whole range of um, sources. But the top sort of sources of nutrient pollution that reach our aquatic ecosystems usually come from the wastewater treatment or sewerage, the agricultural fertilizers, uh, livestock waste, our stormwater drains, and also aquaculture. So what I want to move on to now is just talking about, okay, so we know that this is happening in our aquatic ecosystems, in, in our coastal systems, which provide these really important um, ecological services for us. So what can we do to actually manage eutrophication? And this is something that many people have been working on for decades because eutrophication is not an emerging issue. It's been around for a long time. And usually a lot of uh, government agencies um, manage eutrophication. So a key way to do it is, is to manage the loads. So the loads are the total amount of nutrients that are going into the waterways. So this is an example where people have monitored all the um, 
drainage or the rivers and drainage systems that are going into the the Peel Harvey estuary. So this is down in Mandra, just south of Perth. Um, you can see that there's a range of catchments. So um, there's the serpentine catchment, the Murray catchment, the Harvey catchment, and they all have rivers and drainage systems. You can see them, the little blue lines on the map, that when they flow, they, the water flows into the Peel Harvey estuary, that little blue um, shape on the left-hand side of the graph that made up of the Peel Inlet and the Harvey Estuary. Um, so they work out the amount of nutrients coming in from all these different tributaries, these little rivers, and the type of land use that's occurring in those tributaries. And then they can work out the proportion um, for each sort of land use activity where the nutrients are coming from. So if we look at this pie chart um, in the bottom right of the graph, of the page, sorry, you can see that the greatest proportion of, in this case, it's phosphorus, is coming from grazing lands. So 39% of the phosphorus that's going into the Peel Harvey system comes from grazing. Only 1% comes from horticulture and 1% from forestry and 1% from agriculture and 2% from cropping crops. So if you want to really focus on reducing the loads, then it's grazing and the residential areas where you, you need to um, put your most focus and effort in. So what a lot of the um, people do that work in this area is they do modelling. So they model the flow of the rivers and the groundwater coming into the estuary and they calculate, okay, how much, how many nutrients or what are the loads that are going to maintain a healthy ecosystem and stop it from sort of switching to the unhealthy eutrophic conditions. So in this case, this table is showing the three main catchments, the Serpentine, the Murray and the Harvey. So the, that's the column on the left-hand side. And this is saying, okay, if we can get our phosphorus loads, so it's in T tonnes PA per annum, down to 21 for the Serpentine, 16 for the Murray and 38 for the Harvey, uh, we're going to be able to have a, a healthy ecosystem. And then they work out exactly how much is coming in. So in this case, 69 tonnes per annum from the Serpentine, 16 from the Murray and 61 from the Harvey. So you can see that it's the Serpentine River, which is in the very top of the catchment, and the Harvey River, which is right at the bottom of the Peel Harvey, they're the ones where the most activity needs to be done to reduce those nutrient loads. So in this case, it's the serpentine up here um, coming in sort of just to the east of Mandra and the Harvey River down the bottom that needs to have the most action to reduce the nutrient loads. So those load reductions can be done through a variety of ways through educating the, the farmers and the graziers and the, the residential population to reduce the, the nutrient use um, by planting um, vegetation along the, the streams and rivers to take up the nutrients before it actually reaches the wetlands. So there's a variety of things that can be done in that space. So Another way to manage eutrophication is by actually pumping oxygen into the waterways. And this is something that's done at a number of places um, in, a, in Southwest um, WA. So in this case, this is in the, the Swan River or the Swan River Estuary. Up near Cabersham, there's this oxygen plant. And what happens, you can see where it says suction, the plant sucks water in from the river pumps it through this oxygen um, tank, which you can see the picture on the right, and then discharges it back out into the, into the river. And 
this graph shows what happens when that system is turned on. So on the, this is sort of a, a, a graph, the top line is the surface of the water and the bottom line is the bottom of the river. And so the Y axis is the water depth. And on the bottom is the dates. So this is looking at how oxygen changes over time and the colors show you the oxygen concentration. So red is super low, um, blue is medium and green is a high oxygen concentration. So at this place in the Swan River estuary, when that oxygen machine is off, um, you can see that there's hardly any oxygen there. It's red, um, so low oxygen. And then on the 22nd of April, that machine's turned on. And within 24 hours, it's going from red to blue, showing that oxygen concentration is increasing. And then it's up to really high levels in a couple of days. Then on the 27th of April, that machine gets turned off and you can see that oxygen concentration starts to get drawn down um, near the bottom of the river. It goes red again near the bottom, but there's still oxygen at the surface. So it can be really effective and quite rapidly. And this is really valuable. I think I've just, my screen's got stuck again. Ah, here we go. Um, because if you think about it, fish, they can swim in the surface. If the oxygen gets low, they can swim away and find some oxygen rich water. But the animals that usually live on the bottom, like the mussels and the worms, they can't really move very well. So they're likely to die when the oxygen concentrations are really low. So there's real value in um, helping the support the biodiversity and the ecosystem by turning these oxygen systems on. But, it's not only saving the fauna with these oxygen systems, it's also um, reducing the nutrient release from the sediment. So I said earlier on, when there's really low oxygen um, in the sediment or in the water just above, in the water column just above the sediment, um, because of this organic matter breaking down, what happens is these low oxygen concentrations increase the rate of phosphorus getting released back into the water column. Because phosphorus in, with oxygen, it's usually bound to particles, but in low oxygen or no oxygen conditions, it gets broken off from those particles and released into the water column. Ammonium also gets released. So when you have low oxygen, these nutrients are getting released back into the water column and they stimulate that phytoplankton growth again. So by adding oxygen, it breaks that cycle and reduces the continual uh, algal blooms. So that's, that's a wrap from me today about management of eutrophication in coastal waters. So I hope you've um, got a better understanding of why our coastal ecosystems are so important and how nutrients uh, affect that process of eutrophication and different management approaches that can be used. And it's usually these management pro processes that I talked about have been activities that are managed by government or industry, but you also can make a difference to managing eutrophication and reducing the nutrients that are getting to our waterways. If you like gardening, certainly think about using Eat slow release fertilizers or using organic mulches to improve your soil condition and grow native so you don't need to add as many nutrients. Pick up any pet waste and reduce that pollution um, so that all the, the waste from your um, pet isn't getting washed into the waterways and the storm drains. You can make sure that you don't put leaf and grass clippings into the street or down the drain because that increases the organic matter reaching our waterways. Driving less is going to reduce the amount of nitrous oxide emissions and that atmospheric deposition that occurs. Um, and if you can, if your uh, property is still on septic and you have the opportunity to switch to a sewer system, that's much better because the nutrients can get um, taken out much more effectively in that kind of system. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Has anyone got any questions? And I've got a few minutes left.
Um, how often do you see eutrophication in Perth and is there like a time of year where it's like in most common and like it increases? So once a system is going through eutrophication, it's it's eutrophied. So the Swan River estuary is eutrophied, um, Leshenol, the Bass one are up. But there are particular times when you're much more likely to see phytoplankton blooms, which are a symptom of eutrophication. And usually that happens just after the winter rains, because when it rains, the, it washes the nutrients from the catchment into the river. And then after the winter rains in spring, we're getting warmer temperatures. So that increases the um, rate of phytoplankton growth. And also if you've got really calm conditions, they are the sort of the three key factors that are likely to result in a phytoplankton bloom. Um, yeah, no um, in the experiment, how did you measure the amount of plankton in the beaker? Well, I actually didn't do that experiment, but I have done them and there are a number of ways that you can do it. Um, so you can take samples over time and count under a microscope the number of phytoplankton cells. So the rate of growth is essentially how the number increases over time. But there's also other instruments that you can measure as well. There's something called a fluorometer and a fluorometer measures fluorescence and it, it actually measures the fluorescence in the the chlorophyll molecule in the phytoplankton. So with higher amounts of fluorescence means more phytoplankton. So you can do that. You can use a fluorometer as well, or um, you can also do analytical approaches where you extract the chlorophyll in a chemical analysis. Maybe one more, do we have? Yeah. Um, all right. Do the toxic algae species that poison mussels and crabs also poison the flatheads and brown that eat them? So, yeah, they can do. So essentially, um, because the fish will be, the water comes over their gills um, for their breathing and those toxic algae can get caught in the fish. Um, if they're eating um, anything that that toxic algae has accumulated in, like filter feeders, then yes, they would consume it and it could impact them as well, but at a higher concentration um, than other organisms.